I want to talk about the manga series Aun, which is currently being published in Japan. The last issue was released about a month or so ago. I originally prepared a talk about this for the Popular Culture Association conference with the title of my paper being Illustrating Enlightenment, the Life of Kukai in the Manga Aun. Here you can see the, the spine and one of the covers of the book that depicts Kukai. You'll notice that the mangaka, the manga artist, likes pastel colors, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But I'll start by talking about some of the major types of Kukai biographies that have appeared throughout history. The first group is about what I wrote my dissertation on, and that's the historical biographies written when Kukai was alive or soon after by those who knew him personally. Some of the autobiographical statements Kukai made went into writing these biographies. The representative work in this is the one that appears at the beginning of the Hinjo Haki Seireshu, the collected prose and poetry of Kukai, by his disciple Shinzen or Shinzai. A second group of biographies, at least in my taxonomy of biographies of Kukai, were produced during the Kamakura period. There is a theory that holds that during the Kamakura period, Buddhist traditions competed against one another for patronage, and one of the ways that they were able to gain patronage is by presenting miraculous stories of the foundation of their sects. So, according to this theory anyway, this is why so many miracles in the life of Kukai seem to be first recorded in the writings from this period. The next type of biographies, or Maybe it's just one biography. According to my analysis, is the Shikoku pilgrimage to 88 temples commemorating and participating in the events of the life of Kukai. As far as I know, there have not been work done on this kind of biography right now. It's got a lot of potential for research. For example, scholars can study how the geography of Shikoku is related to the life story of Kukai and traveling around Shikoku either on bus, foot, train, or any other way, is related to traveling time in several senses. So space and time, you're traveling the years of Kukai's life. I think it's also interesting to think about in terms of Shikoku being a biography of Kukai. The events that you see, the events the pilgrims experience, don't occur chronologically in the order of years of Kukai's life. When we look at the illustrated biography of Kukai from the Kamakura period, there's also some of this. So we see in that biography that there's some chronological order to the illustrations, but then there are some illustrations that seem to occur one after another because they happen either in the same place or similar events are placed side by side in the illustrated scrolls, such as times when people became jealous of Kukai. If we talk about a biography in terms of things that happen in the same place rather than chronologically, then we can apply that to the Shikoku pilgrimage because you're viewing events in the same place rather than an event that happened at Temple One being prior in Kukai's life to events that occurred in the later temples. In fact, Kukai's birthplace is Temple Number 75, Zenzuji. At least that's how it's depicted today in his biographies and at Zenzuji. And then a fourth category, according to this taxonomy that I'm creating, is the current fictive depictions of Kukai that you find in modern mediums, such as film and manga, including Aun, the topic of this talk. I've spoken elsewhere about the Oyadaishi Gyojo Zue, the illustrated biography of the events or happenings in the life of the great master of Mount Koya, but I just want to reiterate a few points because we're going to see them again taken up in Aun. So this is an early version dated 1319 Kamakura period. This is a Kamakura illustrated biography. During the Kamakura period, there was an effort to promote Buddhism to a popular audience, not just intellectuals or intellectual scholar monks who were studying sutras, but by using popular media. This is an illustration from those scrolls of the auspicious birth, depicting Kukai's parents have a simultaneous dream of Indian saint Amoga Vajra, and his mother becomes pregnant. This shows child play. The five or six-year-old Kukai molds a Buddha out of mud 
as it says in the Lotus Sutra, and talks with Buddhas on a lotus flower. This one says, vow and throws his body away. At the age seven, Kukai climbs Shashin Gadake and says, when I grow up, I want to save all sentient beings. If I shall have that power, please bless me with a long life and jumped into a ravine. In answer, a beautiful sound was heard and a celestial maiden appears and caught him. This peak can be visited behind Temple 73, Shu Shakuji, in Kagawa Prefecture in Shikoku. This shows quick in learning and love of study. Kukai enters the National University and studies Confucian classics under his uncle Otto. Twenty years old, goes forth, leaves home under Master Gonzo at Seifukuji Temple. And then later he receives the full precepts, full ordination at age 22. Subdues demons, Maras, at Kuzura Tani Mountain Temple in Izu. By writing passages from the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, the Prashnaparamuta Sutra, in the air. Later in scroll 2, drawing 8, writes characters in the air and dragon on flowing water with a boy who turns out to be Monjushri. I wanted to review those so that we can compare it with the way that these events are depicted in the manga Aun. Aun was first released October 10th, 2014 in Big Spirit Comics Special. It's illustrated and written by Okazaki Mari, and this is the cover of the first volume. It shows Saicho on the left and Kukai on the right. Saicho was the founder of the Tendai school in the Heian period, and Kukai was the founder of the Shingon school in the Heian period. Both Kukai and Saicho went to China at the same time. They studied with different masters and brought back different parts of the Dharma. Okazaki Mary was asked by her editors to write a series about Kukai and Saicho. She said she had heard their names but didn't know anything about the lives of Saicho and Kukai before she was asked to do this. In my opinion, she might have been asked to do this because there was a movie that became popular that was made jointly by Chinese filmmakers and Japanese filmmakers and stars, Chinese film stars and Japanese film stars. The film's based on a novel, or a novel series actually, by Yume Makura Baku. His novels are called Shaman Kukai, which means Shramana Kukai. The filmmakers took parts of his longer novel series and made the film that was somewhat popular in China and Japan. Called in English, Legend of the Demon Cat. Yume Makara is most famous for writing On Myoji, which means Yin Yang Master, which was also turned into a couple of movies in Japan that had a lot of success. And On Myoji, based on his novels, also became an online game. After the success of the movie, he came out with a manga series in 2018 that depicts the events of the movies. There's a lot of Kukai manga, actually. We can talk about the one from 1995, Doraemon history manga. Doraemon is that blue cat figure who goes through the history of Kukai's life, and this is in a series where Doraemon goes through other people's lives as well. Here's a screenshot of Okazaki's Twitter page that shows Kukai and events that she's done to promote Aun and other things that she's written. At the same time that she's writing the Kukai manga series, Aun, she's also writing another series that was first released in September 2017 called Kashimashi Meishi. You can see that she used pastels in this cover too. And Kashimashi Meishi is about 
food. That's about domestic life. It's classified as Jose manga. That's manga for adult women. But manga remains pretty popular throughout Japanese society. People of a lot of ages read manga. When she was talking about this series in an interview, she said, for example, and I think this example shows her attitude about why she likes to write this manga. Originally, I'm not good at cooking. I hate it. But I did my best, thinking that this was also training for me. You can see this often in Kashi Mashi Meshi. Shredded cabbage is good, as it is already. Mixing it with pork, with chopsticks and flour, it becomes okonomiyaki. Let's make this together. It's interesting. Live while you're making it. I'll make it myself. You can put it in the refrigerator and have okonomiyaki next morning. You can also freeze it. You can eat it with takoyaki and dumplings. I recommend it. So very down-to-earth food manga. She was born in Nagano in 1967 and grew up in Kansai. Kansai is known to be friendly and not so fast-paced and business-oriented like Kanto, where Tokyo is. From high school age, she participated in drawing competitions organized by different magazines, and this allowed her to gain some experience and some money for her School of Fine Arts, which she went to in Tama. After graduating, she began her career in advertising as a draftswoman and designer in the advertising agency Haku Hodo. She received several awards over time by the magazine Fan Road Report Comics, and she was contacted by the editorial staff and given an offer to draw a manga series. She accepted the offer and drew her first two manga called Marine and Tochu Kaso, both published by Report Comics. In 1994, she decided to go into manga as her profession. She continued for a few years with her advertising agency, and in 2001, she finally resigned and devoted herself full-time to her mangaka career. She said she likes to make beautiful images in manga and ethereal atmospheres. She saw real success in a series that she wrote that's called Supraili, which is Emotional Supplement. This is a Jose series written and drawn by her. It was pre-published in Shodan Shah's magazine, Phil Young. It was later linked together in 10 volumes from June 2004 to January 2010. The series was translated to English, French, and Polish, respectively, by Tokyo Pop. During its release, the manga also was adopted into a drama into 11 episodes broadcast on the Fuji TV channel from June 2006 to September 2006. This series follows the hardships of a woman who tries to make it in the business world in an advertising company, which she had experience with, as a young single woman among salarymen and it depicts love life and hardships in that world. This is why it's considered a Jose manga, a woman's manga, not necessarily a shoujo manga, which would be younger women. Here's a photograph of Okazaki giving a lecture about her series, Aun. Here's another photograph from her Twitter page that shows the advertising for the talk that she gave at Koyasan Daigaku, that's Mount Koya University, where the Shingon Buddhist monks who want to go to university typically go. So that's kind of interesting, right? We should think about that a little bit, that her depiction of Kukai and Saicho's life becomes a topic at the university where students study the life and practices of Kukai. We should think both how these depictions affect those students, but also society in general, because a lot of people who are going to read these mangas aren't going to read other biographies of Kukai. The same is true with Yume Makara's novels and the film about the legend of the demon cat. In these pop culture events, sometimes, the depictions become better known than certainly the original writings, the earliest writings of Kukai's biography, but also the later Kamakura depictions in the scrolls of Kukai's biography. We can see this happening before our eyes in our time, changes in the way Kukai is depicted. One reason I think this is important for us to consider is because temples rely on patrons, and why do patrons come to Buddhist temples? A lot of reasons, but one reason might be they're attracted by these popular culture images that they see at the movies and in manga. 
So in order to keep those patrons who understand this view of Kukai's biography and who Kukai was, priests sometimes respond by promoting those images, even at the expense of their earlier doctrine. So that becomes Buddhist doctrine. So it works two ways. The Buddhist doctrine influences how the pop culture media is represented, and then in turn the popularity of that pop culture representation influences the way that the institutions of Buddhism operate. Okazaki also spoke at Enrakuji, that's at Mount Hiei, so that's the Tendai school. So she spoke at both Center for Shingon Study and also the Center for Tendai Study in Japan. Here's depictions in her manga of Saicho on the left and Kukai on the right. Saicho was a few years older than Kukai, and when I first heard this manga series title, Aun, I thought that Kukai was going to be A. Ah. So Aun means the Alpha and the Omega. It's the first sound in Sanskrit and the last sound in Sanskrit. The reason I thought Kukai would be A ah is because Kukai taught a meditation called the Ajikan, meditation on the sound A, ah, the A-G, the, the A ah character, and Khan is meditation. And A ah is the mantra of Mahavarachana, or in Japanese, Dainichi no Rai, that is the Buddha of Light, who is at the center of the Shingon Mandala. And when Kukai allegedly manifest as a Buddha in this life, he became Mahavarachana. So his mantra, his sound, would be Ah. My guess is that the mangaka did not know that. Maybe she wouldn't care if she did know it, but that's why I thought Kukai would be Ah. Turns out, Saicho is Ah, and Kukai is Un. I can see why she would depict Kukai as Un, the end, the Omega, because throughout her series, Kukai has a close relationship with death. In fact, I would like to analyze the way that she depicts Kukai in terms of Yami Kawaii culture in Japan. Yami Kawaii means cute sickness. This became a fashion trend in Japan among a certain group of people. We might compare it to goth movement in America just because gothics are interested in death a lot of times, but it's a little different in Japan. Yami Kawaii culture, for example, loves pastels. And I think this fit in with Okazaki's own preference. I don't know if this was intentional, that she used this love of pastels to connect with Yami Kawai, or if it's just my analysis, but in my analysis, they're connected. People in Japan who adopt this culture or this fashion statement like to put makeup on to make themselves look sick, wear band-aids. We can see this in the illustration of Kukai that I put on this page, Okazaki opens the series with this quote from Kukai that's in his prose and poetry as well as his philosophical writings. My English rendering of this is born, 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 darkness in the beginning of life, death, 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 darkness in the ending of death. Okazaki's taken this darkness in Kukai's personality and in my opinion attached it to the current trend of Yami Kawai. This appeals to young readers, and while she's primarily known as a Jose, a woman's manga writer, this also is attractive to young men, shonen or seinen. To expand on this poem just a little bit more than she did, this poem appears in the Hizoho Yaku, which is one of Kukai's major philosophical works. The title means The Jeweled Key to the Secret Treasury. Darkness is the last word in the Japanese version, and it's this character, Mei, which also means the underworld or the dead, but it can mean shade or shadow. The entire quote in the Hizoho Yaku says, Blind beings of all four types of beings do not know they are blind. Born, 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 born. They do not know when they were born. Die, 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 die. They do not know when they will die finally. So that's another translation possible from this prose or poetry work by Kukai. The manga opens with some hardships that Saicho has. It begins hundreds of years later when his temple in Rakuji was burnt down, and then it looks back on the life of Saicho and how he became a Buddhist. 
especially depicting his mother's hardships and getting him into a good Buddhist school. So even though this doesn't appear in Saicho's biography, because Okazaki is known for Jose manga and she has interest in depicting the hardships of women, I think that she invented this part of the story. And as we will see, she also invented parts of the story that has to do with Kukai's mother. The scene here is when Kukai is introduced and it says that he's at Nagaoka Kyo University and a professor comes in and calls out his name before he takes the name Kukai. He's named Mao. So the professor comes in, Mao-sama, Mao-sama, Mao-sama. I'm Professor Okada. What are you doing, Mao-sama? It's dangerous. You put a rope around your neck last night in bed. What would have happened if you fell asleep like that? You would have died. And then, ah, your leg. Look out, that's ridiculous. And then Kukai describes that he can't sleep. I have to sleep too. I can't stand this tedium. The professor says, as a university student, you're outstanding. Kukai replies, one's life is not long enough. In the next passages, Kukai goes on to quote long passages from the Rites of Zhou, which is a Chinese Confucian classic, from the Book of Mencius, from the Annals of Duke Yin of Lu, and the I Ching, the Book of History, and the Tao Te Ching. He quotes long passages and says that these words are meaningless in my head, it's unbearable, and that he says he wants to quit the university. The professor says, this is ridiculous. Why should you have this ability to memorize long passages? And Kukai says he's not happy with this. You can see that he tries to commit suicide. As far as I can tell, the manga merges several incidences reported in the illustrated biography of Kukai. That is, that he was quick to learn, that he was really good at school, and also, according to the illustrated biography, it happened maybe 10 years earlier, that he threw his life away. In my opinion, Okazaki took this idea that he threw his life away and changed it to fit the Yami Kawaii obsession with death. In the 1983 film version of Kukai, we saw yet another depiction of him throwing his life away, a different version of jumping off the mountain. In that version, he's already older, has already started to know about Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> On this page, Kukai has left the university. He's looking beat up and rather sick. It seems like his sickness is mental illness, and he's looking very yami kawaii. He goes to a guy he's heard of named Gonzo. I want to remind you that Japanese manga is read from the right page to the left page. So on the right page it says me, and then the left page, fill me. So Kukai is feeling empty by these studies of Confucian classics, and he asks Gonzo, an esoteric Buddhist master, to fill him. This also, I think, appeals to young Japanese people who love manga, who feel that they're empty. We can also analyze this manga, Aun, in terms of the way that Okazaki depicts the plight of women during the Heian period. And we can compare this to the manga that she drew, the Jose manga, Supuri. On this page, the young Saicho, who looks like a big-eyed girl in here, but it's the young Saicho, is crying. I feel that the young Saicho cries a lot in this manga, and this is in contrast to the young Kukai, who's tough. His mother tries to comfort him. He wants to do great things, but he's not able to because his family is not in a position to let him develop his talents. So his mother goes to a political leader in her region and begs him to let her son go to a connected temple and get a good education and become a great monk. And the political figure says, that can be arranged for a certain price. <laughs> and then they drink sake together, and she ends up sleeping with the guy in order to promote her son. This page shows the teenage Kukai walking through the capital after he's been sent away from his native Shikoku into the university. And in the capital, he can see things that other people can't see, and he can hear things that other people can't hear. Part of the things that he sees is the ghost of people who have been abused in the capital in the past. So on the right page up the top, it's the abuse of 
a woman by a court woman in their rivalries. And we might notice in this picture that this is interesting in several ways. One way, I'm kind of surprised that Aeon women are depicted in this way. But also, if this is meant to be a religious comic in any way, this is a surprising depiction. And this isn't the only one throughout her series. There are quite a few nude scenes that she depicts and scenes of violence. We find out in Volume 4 who this woman is. In one of the many places where Okazaki rewrites historical events, making the biography much richer in this way than earlier versions, even if no more believable, Okazaki depicts events leading up to a failed attempt by Emperor Heisei to regain the throne by overthrowing his brother, Emperor Saga, in the year 810. The incident was blamed on Heisei's lover, a woman named Fujiwara no Kusuko, and she was punished for it. Turning these events into the hardship of palace women, Okazaki creates a story wherein Kazuko is first beaten, choked, and raped by her drunk husband, Fujiwara no Tadanushi. Then a short time later, Kusoku intervenes as Crown Prince Ate, who will later become Emperor Heisei, is beating a young girl. To stop the beating, Kusuko throws herself at Prince Ate, who, seeing that she's been beaten and bitten badly on the breast doesn't stop and forcefully has sex with her in front of the young girl while laughing maniacally. Recent history has exonerated Kusuko from the blame in the Heisei incident. In fact, until a couple decades ago, it was called the Kusuko incident. Now it's called the Heisei incident and taught that way in schools. I think that Okazaki is playing on this. Another reason she might bring this up is because Kukai supported Emperor Saga in the incident, which eventually landed him in the foremost priestly position in Japan. Okazaki makes Kusuko a hero, a saint-like figure, and a Heian beauty. But not only can Kukai see this and hear the sounds of this past history of the capital, but he can actually see the words. This is important for this manga, that Kukai can see the words. I'm really interested in knowing whether Okazaki understood that Kukai had a theory of language. And part of his theory of language says that the universe is speaking to us. He goes on to describe the elements of nature that we see around us, the trees and all material objects, are comprised of sounds. These are vibrations, like mantra, but also like ordinary words. They're vibrating and so are the elements of nature vibrating around us. Each of the five elements has its own vibrational frequency and its own mantra and its own color associated with that vibrational frequency. For Kukai, there's actually six elements, earth, wind, fire, air, water, and mind, and language and reality are connected. According to most schools of Buddhist thought, including the Yogacara school, at the highest level of ultimate truth, there is no language. According to Kukai and Shingon, at least Kukai's variety of Shingon, ta-ta-ta, suchness, and the true nature of reality, dharmata, or paramartha, is vibration. Also consciousness is vibration, and perception of vibration. And these vibrations are depicted by Kukai as language. Later there was a faction in Shingon that challenged the idea that the dharmakaya, the universe, is speaking, and that it's relating a language. This faction is known as Shugi Shingon, which means New Shingon, as opposed to Kukai's Kogi Shingon, or Old Shingon. It was founded by Kakuban. Kakuban lived 1095 to 1143, posthumously known as Kogyo Daishi, which means the great master who increased or produced the teachings. Again, I don't know if Okazaki was aware of any of this, but we can apply Kukai's theory of language to her depictions in manga in a lot of ways. Now the manga goes back in time. On the top right, Kukai, as an early teenager in the capital, wandering around, thinks back on the time when he was in Shikoku and the time that he dealt with an official political person there in Shikoku. Again, Okazaki is making a statement about the hardships that politically powerful people sometimes impose on people with less power. And we see the young Kukai on the left side of the page talking to this guy. And they're at the top of a cliff in the middle column there. And Kukai is remembering this story 
to his uncle Otto, who asked him about what happened that time that you threw yourself off the cliff. So in the manga, we have this story of Kukai throwing his life away, throwing himself off the cliff. But we also have other times in the manga where Kukai stabs himself in the leg or tries to hang himself, even though this is not a habit that Kukai had of trying to kill himself, even in terms of the illustrated biography of Kukai from the Kamakura period, much less the earliest depictions of Kukai. But the manga series makes it where Kukai is suicidal. I don't think we're supposed to take that from the illustrated scrolls that Kukai is actually suicidal, but it's been changed to depict him in that way in the manga in order to appeal to a certain audience. In the manga depiction, Kukai knows some things about this political figure who gets so mad that he shoves the young boy off a cliff. So he's not just suicidal here, but he gets shoved off a cliff, which completely changes the earlier story. But maybe because she depicts it as being shoved off the cliff by a political figure here, she brings it back up when he's in college that he actually threw his life away. I really don't know why she depicts it in this way. But the young Mao survives, and he comes walking up to the political figure's great astonishment. His mother sees him, asks what happened, he's all beat up, and he doesn't say, he doesn't tell that the political guy pushed him off the cliff. And the political guy is so grateful for that that he bows down to him and tells him that he'll help him to enter the university. I want to talk a little bit about code versus code in the case of kanji. Code versus code is image versus words, as Charles Hatfield says in his book, Alternative Comics and Emerging Literature, 2005. Theorists talk about how comics, including manga, depict a story in a lot more ways than just what's actually happening in the narrative that you perceive on the surface by reading the story. But there's all kinds of other things happening. For example, the way that the panels are laid out and the space between the panels are all a part of the code that imparts information to the reader, who, according to Foucault and Barth, are also supplying and filling in information. We can see on this page a smaller panel within a panel, or among two panels, and on the bottom left we can see the words coming out of the mouth of this person that Kukai can see, that the other person can't see that he's walking with, and we can see these words, these kanji, these Chinese characters, floating up before Kukai's eyes. One thing I want to point out about this is that kanji, Chinese characters, are also drawings. So I mentioned that Kukai's theory of language holds in part that the elements of reality are language. But there's also something about Kukai's theory of language that has to do with not only the sound of mantra and the sound of spoken word, but also the sight of it is important in his theory. We can apply this also to Buddhist sutras in East Asia, that when you chant a sutra like the Heart Sutra at a Buddhist temple, even if you know the Heart Sutra from your memory, you should hold the book in your hand and look at the Chinese characters that depict the Heart Sutra because the physical text and the sight of these Chinese characters are as important as the sounds that you're chanting. So we can talk about, like a lot of people have, the medium versus the message, or in this case and in the case of the Heart Sutra, the message is the medium and the medium is the message. So that's to say, it's not just what is being said in the Heart Sutra. In fact, Japanese people that chant the Heart Sutra typically cannot understand the words of the Heart Sutra because they're in Sino-Japanese pronunciation. That's a Japanese version of the Chinese pronunciation. It's not the way that Japanese people normally talk. But the sound of it is important, more so than the story or the meaning, meaning's an interesting word here, of what's being said through the sutra. But the sound is important, and the look of the character is important. And all of these things are sacred. The sutra book itself, the characters written in the sutra book, the sound of the characters being pronounced, and the story. They're all sacred. We can apply that, as Kukai does also, to the elements of reality or nature around us, so that all of the things around us, the trees, the flowers, the grasses, and everything, is comprised of sound or vibration. And all of the elements that make it up are sacred, and they're the words of the universe. 
Next page, Kukai again sees the scary sights of people around him, and some of these people are vomiting up words that Kukai can see and hear. Some of these words and sounds are repeated, and there's a qualitative and a quantitative increase at the same time. I want to compare this a little bit to Nobel Prize laureate Kawabata Yasunari's writings. In those writings, which are influenced by haiku and other poetic forms, Kawabata sometimes uses multiple picture depictions, which is a property of kanji. So, for example, there's tree, and then if you put two trees together, there's the woods. If you put three trees together, there's a forest. In Snow Country, for example, Yukiguni by Kawabata, he sometimes uses this property to create his own depiction of multiplicity. And so, for example, he says, rain, 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 to depict that it's raining really hard and it's raining for a long time. And women, 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 to depict that there's a lot of geisha there in Snow Country. The comic theorist Charles Hatfield writes about the tension of text as experience versus text as object, and that these things work together. When I look at this page, I can see what Hatfield means. In this page, Saicho's mother takes Saicho to the temple that he's been accepted in. Remember, she had to sleep with the political figure to get him accepted into the temple. And when his mother leaves him there at the Kokubunji, which is a national temple, so there were the kind of big shot temples around that the government supported. This is his mother leaving him. The writing, the words on this page, it's again repeated over and over, is katakana, katakana typically represents sounds in Japanese. Not always, but as we saw with kukai, some of those sounds were represented with kanji. But katakana is a script that typically represents foreign words and sounds. And in this case, it says, beri, 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 which is onomatopoeia. That's words that sound like the thing that they're depicting. For example, in English, we can say bang sounds like the actual shooting of a gun that's onomatopoeia. And in Japanese, this beri 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 is the sound of something thick ripping. So in this drawing, uh, Okazaki, the page is ripping, and this sound is all around them. And this represents the rip between these lives, the mother of Saicho, and Saicho being left at the temple. He's leaving home, and he might not see his mother again. The page rips with the sound, the page curls up, and you can see this open sky beyond there kind of this wide open future that you don't know what's going to happen next. This other drawing shows Kukai running and it's with smudged pencil and charcoal depicting this and it reminds us that we're holding this material from the author's hand and from the author's mind. So it's not drawn in what we might think of realistic terms, but it's drawn where you can tell your it's kind of brought to the forefront of your attention that this is a drawing. And this reminds me again of Hatfield's idea, tension of text as experience versus text as object, and the way that they work together. Let me talk a little bit more about Kukai's theory of language and how I think that we can see this in Aun, whether it's Okazaki and Mari's intent or not. In fact, we can see the whole world in terms of this, regardless of how others interpret it. We can interpret it that way if we want. Kukai's theory of language provided Nara Buddhist with the linguistic tools they needed to present Buddhism as an alternative discourse to that of Confucian Ritsuro system. The Ritsuro system is the government system. So in a sense, it's revolutionary both against the way that Confucians were running the government, but also in terms of Confucianism, because Confucianism talks about the importance of language. And Buddhists didn't really have a response to this, especially in the Buddhist view that language is ultimately not important. So before Kukai's influential theory, Japanese Buddhist schools lacked a conceptual apparatus to explain what language is. The relationship between signs and objects, which became important in modern times in Europe and America, semiotic studies, and how discourse constructs the order of society, which is currently important in semiotic theory. In the field of philosophy, and by that I mean what is taught in American and European schools as philosophy, which is predominantly European and American philosophy, there is an event that's called the linguistic turn. The linguistic turn is a major event in the history of philosophy. It happened in the 20th century, 
And it's a change in the way that people view reality, how we approach reality and how we think of reality and how we create our own reality with language. So this became, in the mid-20th century and to this day, one of the major focuses in philosophy. I have not yet seen a philosopher talk about Kukai's theory of language and how Kukai's theory might give us some insight into understanding the nature of reality and our creation of reality through language. Kukai's theory of language talks both about how we create reality through language but also how language creates our reality. So that is to say, the outside world, if there is such a thing, the language of nature influencing us. I believe this is a special instance of panpsychism that the current panpsychist philosophers also have not considered. Here are three passages from writings by Kukai. The first one says, Inscribed with the brush of Mount Sumeru, which is the largest mountain in the center of the world in Buddhist folklore. So the brush is that mountain itself. And the ink of the seas. Heaven and earth itself is the sutra book. All phenomena are comprised in even a single point therein. So all phenomena is even in one dot of ink. And the six sense objects are all included within its covers. So that's from Kukai's collected Works of prose and poetry says show roshu or say reshu. Another quote from Kukai about the nature of language and reality. The five great elements all have vibration. The tenfold world possesses speech. The six sense objects are all letters. Dharmakaya, that's the universe, is reality itself. That's from Kukai's writing called The Meaning of Sound, Letter, and Reality. In that same writing, Kukai says... What we call sound, letters, and reality are the equally shared three mysteries of the Dharmakaya Buddha, that is, the universe, and the inherent manda, the essence of ordinary beings. Going back to the manga, Aun, again we can see how letters appear to Kukai, like he holds them in his hands. They appear the same as any other element of reality. We can see when Kukai goes to Master Gonzo and Gonzo starts telling him about the nature of mantra and the universe that the sick looking, the Yami Kawaii Kukai, begins to see the structure of the universe, the structure of DNA as she has it depicted there. We can see that Kukai finds in the sounds in his hand also that it's the same as plants. He can see the words as if they're physical objects and the drawing, the actual Chinese character, as if they're physical objects coming out of Master Gonzo's mouth and Kukai himself out of his mouth and his sounds producing objects. And from volume four, finally later, Kukai starts to see the world and the sounds of the world come unraveled. So Kukai at this time in volume four is at a sutra lecture with Saicho and Kukai begins to see the elements of the universe unravel with these written lines of the sutra, and he's happy with this revelation. And these writings of the sutra come unraveled, and they wrap up Kukai, and they wrap around Saicho, and they become the whole universe. You can see that both of these pages are blank. There's nothing behind them except for these figures of Kukai and Saicho who's wrapped in these sounds and in these words. Then the next page shows Kukai lying in these words and swimming in these words and finally being happy with this understanding as he hasn't been before with Confucianism and other ways of thinking. The next page shows Kukai and Saicho emerging from this realization and looking at each other. You'll remember from the illustrated scrolls of Kukai, biography of Kukai, that Kukai draws a dragon on the water and that the dragon comes alive. For Kukai, according to this theory of language, there's no difference in the written character and the dragon itself. So Hatfield's tension between text as experience and text as object becomes Kukai's tension between samsara and nirvana. The physical universe is written script. Samsara is this life that we're living, the cycles of rebirth, the mundane world, And nirvana, of course, is extinction and getting rid of your judgments and getting rid of your suffering. 
and Kukai finds in the here and now, samsara, the truth of nirvana is at its core. And he discovers this through realizing what the universe is saying to him through the special language of Tathata, ta, the reality that's around us. Again, the physical universe is a written script. The final slide is a photograph of monks at Mount Koya who are coming to check out Okazaki's talk about the Aun manga. And I put this in here because, again, to reiterate, not only is her manga and her pop culture medium affected by the old stories of Shingon and the theories of Shingon, but then the popularity of her manga turns around and affects the way that monks on Mount Koya interpret the life of Kukai and speak about that to parishioners. The big finish now in terms of theory is this. Bart's idea that readers are engaged in a process of ascribing changing social meanings extends to Aun as a kind of Mobius loop, taking Kukai's folklore into popular culture that feeds back into religion and defines religion as an ongoing social interpretation. Let me give the short version of one why I think Kukai's theory of language is a special version of panpsychism. Two, why I think philosophers are at an impasse in forwarding panpsychism as a viable theory that explains something about the hard question of consciousness. And three, why I think philosophers should consider Kukai's version of panpsychism. First, panpsychist theories almost always have at their core a belief in a sentient universe, either a god, pantheism, or in the case of David Chalmers or recently Philip Joff, the idea that consciousness is an inherent property of the basic components of the universe, atomic particles. Kukai would take this as the opposite of the case. That is, according to Kukai, who applies Yogacara theory to this, the fundamental element of existence is consciousness and atomic particles are an inherent property of consciousness. According to Yogacara's consciousness-only theory, there are no elements of nature that exist outside of consciousness. Kukai describes the Shingon truth concept, that is, the true nature of the universe, from a Majamika perspective and the way that one perceives from a Yogacara perspective. Since generally a theory is only as good as what it explains, let me say something about Kukai's use of Majamika theory for metaphysical understanding and Yogacara for epistemic understanding in terms of what his special type of panpsychism helps us understand. So one thing that his idea that consciousness is fundamental might help us explain is Schrodinger's cat. According to Majamika metaphysics, in the closed box, the cat is not alive and is not dead, but it's also not both alive and dead, and it's also not neither alive nor dead. This is an application of Nargajuna's Majamika Tetralemma, and we might also apply this to the non-orientation ability of the Mobius strip. Epistemically, we say one turns attention or consciousness to the contents of the box. But consciousness, rather than or in addition to atomic particles, is entangled. Although we don't understand all, if any, of this dependent co-arising entanglement, it becomes clear when the box top is lifted. So that's one thing it might help explain. I'd further speculate that the idea that consciousness is the fundamental element might help us explain what appears to be paradoxes, or at least odd properties, of time. In addition, we can apply it to the hard problem of consciousness. So currently, science can tell us some things about the way the brain operates differently when red is perceived versus blue, for example. The hard problem is why do we have qualia, that is, internal states, or states that seem to be internal and seem to be subjective feelings, rather than focusing on neurons and chemical properties. If we consider consciousness the fundamental element and neurons and chemical properties to be inherent constituents of consciousness, this may be a game changer in understanding the hard problem of consciousness.
For Kukai, if we say consciousness is the fundamental element of the universe, we have to qualify this by saying that doesn't mean human consciousness in the narrow sense of the thoughts I'm conscious of. Consciousness is the language of the universe. It's the vibrations that constitute the six elements, earth, wind, fire, air, water, and mind. It's the dharmata, the dharmakaya, the universe.